Hi guys, just one second. I'm setting up um, the screen where I can see all of you and your questions, and then you'll be able to see me in a better light. Hello, I am A.R. Tori. I also write under the name Alessandra Tori, so a lot of you know me as Alessandra, um, but I go by either. I'm here at my home in Florida and doing a live Q&A for you guys um, just to answer any reader questions. I get a lot of questions um, about my job and about my books, and I'm so excited to be here today to talk to you all. The main reason one of the reasons why I'm here is to celebrate uh, The Girl in 60, which is my erotic thriller. This is the hardcover. It is so exciting for me to actually um, be able to hold a hardcover of one of my books. Um, Girl in 60 releases in the UK. It's available now. It released this week. And um, so you can run down. The, your UK cover is really cool. I love it. It looks a little bit like this, but um, the girl's in the middle. And the words are on top of her. It's really cool. I just got a box of them this week, and uh, it was really neat to see the difference. And you also have a little bit different copy on the inside. So, um, so I'm jealous of you guys of your cool accents and um, of your different cover. But uh, I'm going to dive right into the questions. I have a lot of questions. Um, readers submitted them in advance, and then I have live readers now. Uh, a, question that just came through the feed was from Hillary, and Hillary wanted to know why I decided to write an erotic thriller rather than straight erotica. So when I started writing, the first book I wrote was Blindfolded Innocence. It was uh, an erotic romance and was um, very popular, but my reading, my personal reading has always been in suspense. So that's kind of where I have my roots. And I always thought if I was ever going to write a book, it would be a suspense. But somehow, when I sat down, um, Blindfold Innocence came out, and that was a romance. So I always had in the back of my head that I would love to write a thriller, and um, The Girl in 60 was my opportunity to do that. When I was researching uh, Cam Girls, that was just the character that came out, and she was a very dark, intense character, and uh, there was... There was really no way to turn that into a romance. It was, uh, it was a little too, um, too dark for that. For those who don't know, The Girl in 60 is about Deanna. She is an internet camp girl, and she uh, locks herself away in her apartment for three years, which is apartment 60, because she has a really strong desire to kill people. So those are kind of like the roots of the story. Uh, Katie wants to know my favorite thing about being an author. And uh, I have a lot. Uh, if it's the greatest job in the world. If anyone's interested in writing, the first thing I would suggest is you get Stephen King's book. It's called On Writing, and it is awesome. It's the, it's the book that made me really move from being a reader to say, um, you know, I think I can do this. I want to sit down and give it a try. But my favorite thing, honestly, would have to be just the flexibility of my schedule and the fact that I can do it from anywhere in the world and I can write from anywhere. Most of my writing is done in the car or um, like locked away at a family event <laughs> in a closet. But it's, it's a really unique ability to be able to, um, to create your own world and to step inside that world for months at a time. Um, so I get to live in all of my characters while I'm writing and that, that's a really cool thing. Uh, another question I have from Elizabeth is if any of my family members have read my books. And uh, I, when I started writing erotica, I gave all of my family members a strict, well, when I decided to tell them, a strict rule that they were to never read any of my books. That being said, I, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that a lot of them have broken the rules. Um, I know my mother-in-law read Girl and Succeed which just devastated me at the time that I found it out. Um, but she was really cool about it. She was much cooler about it than I thought she'd be. And um, as far my parents have never read anything I've written. Uh, my sister has some lesser family members. But for the most part, no one mentions 
the content of my books and I'm really grateful for that because it would be extremely awkward <laughs> at a family event. So um, someone asked why I decided to start publishing, self-publishing, that was Ronald. And um, I'm what's considered a hybrid author. I self-publish and then I have two publishers, Harlequin and um, Hachette or um, Orbit, and uh, as well as some foreign publishers, obviously. But um, I, start, I decided to start by self-publishing because I really didn't know another way of doing it. If I had not self-published, I would have had to go the traditional route, which involves sending out your manuscript to agents and publishers and um, sending it out a hundred times and hoping to get a call back. I didn't have the personal confidence in my writing. Um, I would not have gone through that process. And self-publishing allowed me to write a book put it on Amazon and Barnes & Noble myself and then just get reader feedback and find out is this something that I have a skill at or is this something I need to set aside and move along. So self-publishing gave me a huge opportunity in that it let me know that I could be successful at this and I had opportunities at this and then that led to publishing deals. I, I enjoy being a hybrid because it allows me to publish stuff that might not be accepted by the traditional market but that I still think that there's a market for. And um, Kristen wants to know what inspired the character of Deanna. And that's a question my husband would love to know. I think uh, after I wrote The Girl in Sixty, he kind of started looking at me a little differently. Um, but uh, I was online one night researching different fetishes. I was trying to decide where I wanted my next book to go. And this, I was searching sex websites, and this pop-up came up. It had this girl, I'm sure you've gotten them before, if you at Korea's adult sites. Uh, this girl was sitting in her room, and she's typing, and I'm sure it was like a mass email. But, you know, she's like, hi, how are you? Well, I clicked on her image, and it took me into her chat room, which was a really interesting place at 2 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday. There were, it was crowded. And uh, there was this flurry of activity in her chat room. And it was very similar. If you've read The Girl in 60 and the scenes where they're in free chat, I mean, that's what it was. Um, and I was just fascinated. And I sat and I watched the um, chatter feed. And, and then she was gone. Um, and someone had taken her into a private room. And I, the first thing I wanted to know was more. I wanted to know who she was, if she had a husband, if she was... Um, she looked like she was in a, um, like a college dorm room, and I wanted to know if that was really where she was or if she was somewhere else. And just my ideas really started going from there, like all of the lies that could be perpetuated from just having a strictly online relationship and, um, and who this girl could be. And so then I really dove into the world of webcamming to try to find out more. And Deanna, uh, I don't know where her homicidal tendencies came from other than... I think that just all of my reading has been in suspense and that was where um, my mind often goes is kind of down a darker path and I really enjoyed being in her head because it allowed me to just you know be crazy and that's uh, always fun. So um, Katie wants to know how I got the cam girls to talk to me and did I have to pay to meet them in private and absolutely I had to pay to meet them in private. If you look at my credit card statements during that month, um, it was expensive. First of all, you really can't carry on a conversation in free chat. Um, there's, there's just too many people. And she's certainly, the, the girl is certainly not going to answer any private questions. There are also male camp models, but I really feel bad for them because um, a girl can um, please herself you know, or fake please yourself a hundred times a day, but a male doesn't have that same ability. But, um, so I had to pay to take them to private, and I chatted with all sorts of women. Cam girls, they're, um, there's large women, there's small women, there's old women, um, there's nobody under 18, but there's young women as far as college students. It's every shape, size, type of woman you'd ever imagine and um, there's pregnant women on there there's just everything so uh, I had to pay to take them to private and um, and a lot of times they wouldn't talk to me I mean 
they're very private individuals and they value client privacy, which I think is a big part of why they're successful. Um, Orison wants to know how I found the process of going from being self-published to being traditionally published. And um, it's been an adjustment in, in a variety of ways. And some ways are really great ways, and other ways are just me having to let go of the reins. In self-publishing, for example, Black Lies is a book that I'm um, releasing August 25th. There's my little <laughs> personal plug for Black Lies. Um, but it's self-published, and it was a book that I took to my agent and said, do you want to take this to the traditional market? And she thought um, that it had too much sex in it for the traditional market, which was fine with me because I enjoy self-publishing. So um, the great thing about self-publishing is right now I'm going through cover models and doing photo shoots, and I have complete control of the cover and of the content. Blindfolded Innocence had a scene in it. That was my first book that had I published it through the traditional market, it would probably have been cut in editing. And for those of you who've read Blindfold in a sense, I'm referring to um, the scene in the strip club where Brad, um, the main male lead, does something. And uh, that probably would have been removed. So um, I have complete control over the editorial process. That being said, I really expected when I got a publisher for them to be very strict about the content and their changes, and I have experienced absolutely none of that. I've published with Harlequin and with Hachette, and both of them come to me with a change or a suggestion, and it's always, if you want to do this, you can. If not, don't. I mean, I, I do have control as, as that goes. That being said, I've never tried to put anything really crazy in a book. Um, and their suggestions have always been extremely helpful. But um, but I do lose that control. I lose the control over pricing. My self-published books I can put on sale for 99 cents or run a promo or advertise in any way that I see fit. Everything with the publisher has to be approved. And, um, and they control everything as far as pricing and distribution and release dates. So that's been my um, biggest thing is just letting go of the reins a little bit. That was That was hard for me to do in the beginning because these really are my children, if that makes sense. And it's hard for me um, to have someone say, no one can see your children, you know, for a year or so when I when they're complete and they're ready and everybody's, you know, wants to see them. So hopefully that answered that question. Um, Baxter asked if I think that the erotic thriller is the next step for the erotic market. Um, I don't know that to be the case. I, for me personally as a reader, I enjoy a level of suspense in my books. I don't want to start a book and know what's going to happen. I, I don't want to start a book and know that this couple is going to meet and have wild and crazy sex and then, um, and then live happily ever after. So I want some suspense. I want some unknown. I want some twists and turns. Um, I think I think that there is a big market for erotic thrillers, and I think the market is just as much going to be taking a piece out of the traditional thriller market as it will um, the erotica market. If anything, it will take a bigger piece, in my opinion, out of the thriller market because I didn't know I've read suspense all my life, and I didn't realize the draw that I would have to reading erotica. I think reading about sex affects you as a reader in a completely different way than reading a um, scary scene. And to have that additional aspect of a book when you're reading it and to be touched in that additional way just increases the overall reader experience. So I think that there is a lot of thriller readers who may start reading erotica if they have a chance to read an erotic thriller just after getting that peak into the world, but um, I think I think there's a huge market for it to answer your question, and um, I don't know that our erotica market as a whole will move in that direction. Um, it's such a strong market in the erotic romance, and that happily ever after and that romance is really important to those readers. That's probably my biggest complaint that I get about Girl and Sixty is they want more romance. And um, you will get that, more of that in the sequel, I promise. Um, 
And that's another question. I had a bunch of readers submit early is asking about the sequel to The Girl on 60. So the sequel to The Girl on 60 comes out in April. Uh, I don't have an exact date. I think I do, but I don't know off the top of my head. It does not have a title yet or a cover, but it is written. Um, and literally all day today I'm going to be working on it as far as going through rewrites. And um, I'm, I'm beyond excited about it. I really am. I think you are going to love it. Um, I think it's just as good, um, if not better, than The Girl in 60. And it basically takes Deanna through the next stage of her life. So I won't, uh, some of you may not have read The Girl in 60, so I don't want to, I don't want to go into it. But there is, um, there is more, uh, you see more sides of her, and there's more relationships there between her and several people. So um, it, it has more of a romance aspect while still maintaining crazy levels of um, suspense. And it's a little sexier, uh, which I think you guys will like. So um, Laverne asked about the theme of being imprisoned in your own home, but surviving through the virtual world. And uh, uh, she also asked, or he also asked if I did any research for this. I didn't, I did not do any research into the world of recluses, but um, I did really have to kind of think outside the box as far as to fill in all the holes of um, how someone would live in existence without leaving their home. And uh, there were some challenges. I had to get a little creative in times, but Today, with the internet, I believe it's 100% possible. I know it's possible. People do it all the time. But um, it was a neat world to experience because Deanna really makes this a world inside her walls. But I think that the interaction she gets through Cammy plays a huge part in her maintaining a certain level of sanity. And that sounds like it makes no sense, considering a lot of people would consider that she is not sane. But um, if you take her homicidal <laughs> urges out of the equation, um, I think you need that human interaction, or at least she does, in order um, to kind of keep her personality well-rounded. And she's still a very outgoing girl, and she's very, still a very social girl, even though she literally um, has not seen another person face-to-face -face in three years. All right, in just a second, I'm going to open up my other spreadsheet. I had a bunch of reader questions that were submitted early, and I just want to try to hit some of those. Um, someone asked what Black Lies is about. Black Lies, again, is my next book. It is coming out, and um, I don't want to give away too much, but it is about a girl who um, kind of is, is pulled between two men, and both of them have secrets, and she has secrets, and there is a lot of... Um, things that are unfolded behind the scenes as the book goes on. It's, <clears throat> it's a really cool concept. It's a really complicated concept. <coughs> Excuse me. For me as a reader, not for you as a, um, as a, for me as an author, not for you as a reader. But it's really neat. It was a huge undertaking for me to dive into, but I think it's going to turn out really awesome. So that's what Black Lives is about. And um, someone asked if there's any misconceptions that people have about your books. That is Myla. Hi, Myla. And uh, I don't, the biggest misconception that people have about my books is that they are about me. And I think that was dissuaded a little bit when I wrote The Girl on Sixty because um, Blindfolded Innocence really told the story of me and my husband and um, us meeting in our courtship, if you want to call it courtship, and um, that uh, wasn't sexy enough. So I certainly sexed it up um, for the for the case of the book. But I think a lot of people, especially people I knew, read that and saw the similarities between that uh, those characters and me and my husband, and they really judged me uh, because of that. The girl in six e that I then wrote, because it's about this crazy recluse cam girl, I think that allowed um, people in my life to see that maybe, um, just because I get in the heads 
of these characters and write their stories doesn't necessarily mean that the books are about me and my personal thoughts and feelings and sexual experiences. But uh, that would probably be the biggest misconception is that I am a certain person and I am a certain way because of the things that I write. So I would say that is the biggest uh, misconception. In just a second, my dogs are being very, hey, hey, um, are being very loud. So um, let's see. Someone asked the hardest part of writing a book, and I would have to say um, the hardest part about writing a book is figuring out what's going to happen. Um, with Black Lies and with Sex, Love, Repeat, both of those books, I got to a point where I just had no possible idea what was going to happen. And I sat there and looked at the um, computer and had put myself into this hole that I really couldn't get out of. And normally the characters take over from that point in time and, uh, and they guide me out of it. But sometimes it involves a lot of um, just soul searching and spending time in the readers in the um, characters' heads and trying to figure out where I want to go from here. So I'd say that's my, my biggest challenge. And just not having enough time. I have so many ideas that, and my biggest fear is that, you know, I'm going to get an accident or something and, um, and pass away without one of my books being written, which is a really morbid thing to think about, but that, that's the type of thing I worry about when I'm going to sleep at night. Um, is getting those is getting those books out. Someone asked um, Warwick asked if I write my books specifically for women or if I have men in mind. I don't. I do not have a gender in mind when writing the books. That being said, writing erotica is a very um, intimate process, and I use my own. Uh, arousal points or um, fantasies when I write. I can't imagine that a man has the same fantasies as me. Maybe they do. I, I don't know. So I, do, I don't set out to write for anyone, but I have to imagine that my books, my, at least my erotic romance, which erotic romance is a market that's 92% women anyways, but um, I have to imagine that those touch a woman differently than a man. That being said, I have a lot of male readers um, and I've corresponded with them. And Girl in 60 is, is very different because Girl in 60, um, because most of the clients are male and she interacts with males, and it uses sexuality in a completely different way, I think Girl in 60 would, would appeal to either sexes equally. Um, but erotic romance, uh, I don't write it for women, but I, I'm sure that it speaks to women um, a little more closely than it speaks to men. So, um, Bella wants to know my favorite book of all time, which is the hardest question anyone <laughs> could ever ask. In fact, she asked it a good 15 minutes ago, and I have avoided it because I don't know the answer to that. Um, On Writing by Stephen King, which I mentioned earlier, was certainly the most life-changing book that I've ever read, but I have so many, I have so many great books. Um, I love Gillian Flynn. Um, all of her books would be on my top list. Um, I like J.D. Robb. I like C.D. Reese. She's an erotica author. Um, there's really not one book because that changes from week to week to year to year, and books fade. It's very hard for me to, you know, keep up keep a front of mind um, of any one book. So it's a horrible answer to your question, but hopefully uh, it told you something. So Mick wanted to know if it's important for me to have some type of love story within my novels. And absolutely not. Um, that when I, when I sit down to write an erotic romance, I have to have a love story It's required. Um, it doesn't have to have a happy ending, but they normally do. Um, but I see myself as an author writing more, more erotic thrillers. I'll certainly, I'll do as many books in the Girl in 60s um, series as there is reader demand for. I think that's a character that I can really take a lot of places. But I don't think a love story um, 
is required with, with those things. And I can see writing erotic thrillers without the love story. See, I'm talking myself out of this question as I answer it. But if it's erotic, having love often makes the sex hotter. So um, I don't know that it's important to me, but um, I've done a really bad job of answering this question. But uh, it often is a necessary element in order to make the book more well-rounded. Doug wants to know who I would ask cast as Deanna in a film of The Girl on 60. And Girl on 60 actually is getting a lot of interest right now from movies and film. I mean, from movies and film. <laughs> from movies and TV. So um, I've, I've done a lot of thinking, and it's a very difficult question to answer. There's a girl I really like. Um, she's the sister to the girl who is in the U.S. version of um, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Of course, I can't think of her name at the time right now, but um, I really like her. It is going to take a very unique actress who is able to do the sexual component of the book and um, as well as do the bright and cheerful character of Jessica, who is the camp girl persona, as well as, as doing Deanna and making her likable. Um, Joanna wants to know my dreams for Deanna and how I see her character developing. And I don't want to give away too much for the pe people who haven't read the book, but um, I obviously want Deanna to be happy, and I want her to be healed, and I want her to be perfect. In the original version of The Girl in 60, if anyone has read it, um, that is what happens in the end. And um, I got a lot of pushback from that, which I really didn't expect because I was writing it for my romance readers. Hey, guys. Because um, I was writing it for my romance readers, but um, and in the real world, that, that wouldn't necessarily happen. So eventually, I think I think the root of it is Deanna needs to be happy, and I'm not necessarily certain that her happy ending is going to come with her being a perfect individual. I think the question is learning to be happy despite that while still not harming others. So, um, but I certainly think that she needs some more relationships in her life and some, um, in a world outside of 60. So, that is sort of where I see her moving. So, um, Sarah, uh, thank you for your nice comment, Sarah. She said uh, that Deanna is very different from, say, Julia Campbell and wants to know what my next uh, lead character will be like. So Julia, for those who don't know, is a, is a very feisty, fun heroine that I had in my Blindfolded Innocence series and is very different um, from Deanna. I try to make all of my female leads confident. That's very important to me to have a strong female lead. So any female lead that I write, um, my goal is to be strong and confident. I failed in that aspect a little bit with my book, The Dumont Diaries, but for the most part, that that's the path that I try to go down. So I can tell you right now, my next lead character is, um, her name is Liana, and she's in Black Lies, and you will love her, and you will hate her, and you will hate her more initially than you love her, um, but she's a very strong, confident woman who just goes through a lot for the man that she loves. Um, and a lot of the things that she goes through, the reader is not going to necessarily agree with. And Katie um, wants to know where the idea for Black Lies came from. And um, I can't answer that right now because it will absolutely ruin the book for anyone who reads it as far as the twist aspect. But uh, I'll be happy to follow. Uh, I, know, I, I know where to find you, Katie, so I'll track you down. And, um, and answer that. And um, Gail wanted to know why I decided to start writing erotic fiction. And um, to be honest, when I sat down, well, Fifty Shades of Grey. When I read Fifty Shades of Grey, it was the first time that I realized that mainstream, that, that I could write a book or read a book that had explicit sex that was still accepted by the mainstream. Any reading that I had done in the past was um, 
any erotic reading that I was done. Um, like adult stores used to sell these little books. I tried to buy one the other day, and uh, I guess they don't make them anymore. <laughs> um, but they used to sell these little books that had like penthouse form letters in them. And that was the only erotic reading that I had ever done. I didn't realize that you could pair explicit sex with a strong plot, and it would be something that people would read and discuss freely. So Fifty Shades of Grey really opened my eyes. I had read some books by Jennifer Kruse. Um, if you haven't read her, she's a great author, and she writes mysteries. Suspense is probably a big word, for, but um, she writes mysteries, um, but they have some heat in them. And that was kind of as far as I thought that I could go um, if I ever decided to write. So Fifty Shades of Grey was like, wow. I can write like crazy hot sex and pair it with a full length book and, um, and there might be a market for that. So when I saw that, that, um, that kind of opened my eyes and I knew that that was the direction that I wanted to go in when I did write. Um, Zoe wants to know if I liked Gone Girl by Gillian Flynn. I, res um, and they, I respected Gone Girl by Gillian Flynn. I, I let, I, I really enjoyed the book. Um, I didn't necessarily agree with the ending. That being said, had I written the book, I probably would have done a similar ending. Um, readers aren't always going to like the endings, even if that is how the ending is meant to be. But I couldn't, um, I guess the correct way to say it is, I couldn't associate with those characters and the choices they made at the end of the book. But I absolutely love the book. I would suggest it to anyone. I think I gifted like seven copies to different people <laughs> because I said you have to read this book. So I, I respect the book. I don't know if, you know, if I'll read it over and over again. But um, I absolutely, Gillian Flynn rocks my world. So um, yes, I guess the answer would be that I like it. So, um, and Joanna wants to know the best advice I can give about writing. And I would have to say to read a lot. Um, I have absolutely no formal training in writing other than a creative writing course that I took in high school or college. I think it was high school. Um, reading has been my education, knowing what I like and don't like. And our market is so flooded right now. It is so difficult for a book to break out. It's difficult for my books to break out, and I have a built-in audience. Um, Writing is not easy. I got extremely lucky. I don't know what happened with my first book and why it went huge um, because I read incredible books all the time that no one's ever heard of and no one's ever read and that have sold like nine copies on Kindle. So my best piece of advice is to write for yourself, not to write for others. If you sell five copies, celebrate it. If you sell a hundred copies, you know, obviously celebrate it, but write for yourself and then the sales don't really matter. Um, because writing in itself, what another thing I love about writing is I read extremely quickly. So for me, I only get to spend a couple of hours inside a certain character or inside a certain world when I'm reading the book. But as a writer, I can spend three months um, in that world. So if you enjoy writing, then the sales really don't matter. And what matters is, um, I'm being really preachy right now, but what matters is, um, is the enjoyment you get out of it. So I would say that my, my, any advice I can give is to write for yourself and because you enjoy it and not because you think that you're going to hit the New York Times list or not because you um, want to make a ton of money. But it is an amazing business to be in and it's such a rewarding business to be in that I'd highly suggest it to anyone, but urge them to celebrate the small things and to not focus all their attention on sales. Um, Lucinda wants to know if I scare myself when writing my thrillers, and because I know what is going to happen, at least when I'm writing a suspenseful scene, um, I don't necessarily scare myself, but I will say 
when I wrote the kitchen scene in The Girl in Succeed. Those who have read it will know what I'm talking about. When I wrote the kitchen scene, it took me to a really dark place. Um, and I got inside the mother's head at that point in time. And it, um, it didn't scare me, but it, it was, I guess it did scare me because, um, you know, I locked my doors <laughs> extra tight that night and, um, and it put me, uh, it just really put me in a dark place and uh, I didn't like being there um, and it made me uncomfortable. So it, it was probably, yeah, a little, the good news is I don't think that I'll ever be going back there in real life. So, um, and Evan wants to know if I think it's important to have fixed genres or audiences in mind when writing a book. And I have to answer that by saying it's important if you want to sell books, which I just got through saying is not important, but if, if it's your sole source of income, which it is for me, then sales are important. So I think, I wouldn't say that, um, I wouldn't affect the plot because of it, but I do think, I, I right now, like with Black Lies, I sat down and I said, okay, I'm going to write an erotic romance. And that was what, you know, that was the genre that I was going in. And I have kept that in mind when writing it. I'm not going to suddenly have one of the characters, um, you know, go on a killing spree because that would ruin the experience for a lot of that audience. So I think it is helpful to have um, an audience in mind, and I think you need to keep that audience in mind um, because once you lose an audience, it's very difficult to get them back. Um, and that was one of the reasons why Girl on 60 is published under a R. Tory versus Alessandra Tory to make a very clear distinction to my readers that this is a different type of book and um, so that they don't go, oh, I bought an Alessandra Tory book and there's this crazy dark character, you know, what is her next book going to be like? Um, the two pseudonyms help to keep that separate. Uh, Victoria wants to know about my dog uh, and he's so cute. She will be highly offended. That was Bella. Uh, she's my little girl. Bella, come here. Come here. Um, I have two. One is Bella and one is Capone. And this is Capone. He's humongous. He's uh, 15 pounds. They're both Yorkie Poos, um, which is half Yorkie, half Poodle. Um, and he is twice as big as she is, and, uh, she, but she runs the house. And he is very sweet, but is a little slow. And... Um, tries really hard but just doesn't have, have the brain power of, um, of her. Yes, I know. I'm going to put you down. And they don't understand why I'm sitting up here. Um, I have toys all around my feet right now because they keep bringing them to me and wanting to know why, why I'm not throwing them. So, um, Hannon, I, I might have mispronounced that. I, if I did, I apologize. Ask what my average working day is like. Um, I have two schedules. I have a productive schedule and a non-productive schedule. Um, in a productive schedule, I should write a book a month. Um, and that would be me writing every day for three to four hours a day um, with a daily average of um, three to 4,000 words a day. That, that's my productive schedule. When I wrote Black Lies, I sat down and said, okay, I'm gonna do 30 days of writing and I'm going to knock this out because I have so many deadlines um, stacked up that I really needed to, um, to focus on getting this done. So in my productive world, I normally either write really early in the morning, I'll set my alarm, get up like at five and knock out um, three or four hours before the house gets up and moving and, and starts being crazy, or I'll write really late at night and that's, um, that's normally like from 10 to 2 or 3 in the morning. And those are the times when I get the most done. I have a very demanding um, family. They, uh, they require assistance constantly. I'm sure a lot of you can understand that. Um, and, and they don't necessarily care if like I'm right in the middle of a really exciting uh, moment or right in the middle of a sex scene. Um, 
to, to ask me questions or to need my help with something. So my typical day, if I'm, um, is normally I write at night. And uh, during the day, I'll spend time on social media. I do edits. Um, normally, I'll write a book, and then I'll be re at the same time working on rewrites and edits on a different book. So I'll spend a couple hours during the day doing some of that type of stuff. And then I normally read in the afternoon or we go to movies or just hang out. So I have a lot of downtime and a lot of flexibility, which is also one of the great things about being a writer. That's, that's my productive schedule. My non-productive schedule, <laughs> I normally write, like, I might write every day, but I'll write 500 to 2,000 words, and um, it just gets kind of stuck in. Um, and, and that schedule, it takes me two to three months to write a book. And a lot of times, I end up being on the non-productive schedule simply because marketing takes up so much time. Um, and it's not something I can outsource. Um, relationship with readers and bloggers is crucial, and, um, and it's one of the more entertaining and enjoyable parts of my job. So it's trying to do that balance, but at the same time design posters and schedule um, blog tours and work on blurbs and covers and edits and uh, all those things that take up just an enormous amount of time. And um, someone asked if Jeremy will play a part in the future of 6E. And, uh, Jeremy, Jeremy certainly plays a part in the sequel to Sixty and um, and their relationship. And I like Jeremy. I don't know why I don't love Jeremy. Will Jeremy be around forever? You know, in book nine of Girl in Sixty, will Jeremy still be there? I don't know um, because Deanna is going through a lot of changes in her life and, um, and she's changing as a person and she's going to change as a person as the series goes on. Um, I know readers love Jeremy um, and that will certainly play a part in my decision. But um, he certainly has a part to play in Future 60. I don't know if when Deanna is 60 years old if Jeremy will be the person next to her in bed. But um, that's who it is. Uh, Anne is asking if I like music too, and uh, a couple of my favorite albums of all time. Um, I love music. I listen to music a lot when I write, not necessarily for the inspirational aspects of it, but because it drowns out my family so um, <laughs> and allows me to kind of focus. But uh, I have a bunch of Spotify playlists. I don't have necessarily um, favorite albums of all time, but... Um, I listen to everything. Uh, when I was writing the girl, uh, when I was writing Sex Lover Pete, I was listening to a lot of reggae and um, beach music and island music. And um, when I was writing the girl in Sixty, I was listening to dark, um, crazy, just like Evanescence or things like that. So depending on the characters, um, that that sort of affects in the setting. That that affects what I listen to. Uh, Samantha wants to know what a Twitter party is, and it sounds like fun. And um, first of all, Twitter. I was I was as against getting on Twitter as anyone could possibly be. I didn't understand it. Um, I had no interest in it. Uh, but I was told I need to be on Twitter. I need to be on all social networks. So I signed up and got on Twitter. And I have to say, other than I have a Facebook group. And that Facebook group, which girls, you know who I'm talking about, has, I've fallen in love with Facebook just due to that Facebook group. Um, but Twitter is really my home. I love Twitter because on Twitter I can write anything and I can post anything. And whenever I find out that family members are following me on Twitter, I'm like, because I write some crazy stuff on Twitter and we, and post crazy sexual videos and everything else. So if, if you're not on Twitter, there are some really cool people on Twitter and it's not like Facebook where you don't have necessarily the accountability or the worry that the PTA mom next door is going to see your post and, and judge you for it. Twitter is just like, I don't, it's an open, um, it's an open free place and it's a really cool place to be. 
But a Twitter party is um, an hour or two hours long, and a lot of times um, I'll post trivia, trivia questions. There, there's a lot of giveaways. There's a lot of different ways to win. But I'll tweet something out, and then um, I'll everybody responds. And sometimes it's like the fastest person to respond with the correct answer wins. Sometimes it's um, the best response. Like I'll ask a question and um, I'll pick five winners from all the different responses. But um, I, I love any parties. I, I do Facebook parties too. Um, normally I do parties around release days. Um, so, but um, hopefully that answers your question. That's a Twitter party and I'd love for you to join my next one. Uh, for all of you out there, if you are not on my newsletter, you can go to my website, alessandratore.com, and sign up for my newsletter. And um, in my newsletter, I'll always put if I'm having any parties or social events online, and you can um, join in. Sophie wants to know if I have plans to come to the UK. I would love to come to the UK. I have um, family in Paris, and um, I am way behind. I should have gone a long time ago and I need to come to the UK. I just need um, a bigger travel budget basically. <laughs> I think I went to like six signings this year um, and that really dipped into my travel fund. So uh, I don't have any immediate plans to come to the UK but I'm hoping to get there um, sometime in the next uh, year or two. Uh, Katie wants to know um, how I overcome people's reaction when I tell them that I write erotic romance. And initially, um, when I wrote my first book, my husband and I were like, okay, we're not going to tell anybody. Like, no one, not my sister, not my best friend, I'm going to tell no one, it's going to be this secret. And that was great when I was selling like 25 copies a day. And then I was selling like 3,000 copies a day. And we were kind of like, and, and I got a publishing deal, and like all this stuff was happening, and I really felt guilty not including like my mother in that, you know, because I knew that she would be really excited about that. And um, so, uh, at that point, we just kind of sat down and we said, you know what, like, screw it, like, this is this is my job, and I'm gonna own it, and it is what it is. So, uh, the reaction I get is varied. Some people immediately feel the need to tell me all about their sex life, which makes for interesting conversation. <laughs> but um, other people, normally the reaction I get is a very guarded one. Like someone's like, you know. But I also, I tell people I write romance novels, so like if I'm in public, some, or if I'm in the grocery store and someone, you know, starts a conversation and asks what I do, or if I'm at a, a social event and they ask what I do, I say I write romance novels, and that makes it easy. And then if they push, which a lot of times people do push, then um, normally they want the names of my books. And at that point in time, I have to say, um, I'd be happy to give you a card, I have a card that has a list of my books. But um, it is erotica, so have you read Fifty Shades of Grey? And um, oh, almost everyone has. And I said, okay, well, if you're okay with Fifty Shades of Grey and that interested you, then, then you should try my stuff. But uh, if it was my preference, no one that I knew would read anything that I wrote. And I have certainly gotten some, like there are friends that we used to have that kind of have faded away. And I think part of that's because they think like we're going to invite them to an orgy on Saturday, which I can't think of a single person that I know that I would want to have an orgy with just because of the um, nothing against their, you know, personal appearance. But that that's just not, you know, what we're interested in. So uh, I don't know as much as I'm overcoming their reaction as we're just at the point, my husband and I, where we're like, it is what it is, and if it changes how you feel about her being me or us, then you know that's that's something you're gonna have to personally get over. So, um, let me. Sorry, my screen went away. Um, someone asked where I got my where I get my inspiration for characters and stories, and I would have to say, and just um, if you have any questions, this is. This chat's going to end at 8:30. Um, 8:30 my in in 
10 minutes. So just let me know if you have any questions um, before then. Uh, someone asked where I got my inspiration for characters, and um, I get my ideas from everywhere, and normally the books are built around a character. So um, I'm trying to think like of an example. Black Lies is a great example, but I can't use that example because it will ruin the book. Um, but I get my inspirations from all over the place. I'll watch a movie and I'll think that the movie's going in one direction, or I'll be like, oh, I know the twist of this movie, and it's going to be a great movie. And then the movie doesn't go there at all. It goes in some other direction. And then I think, well, you know, I should write a book about that. Or um, the other day, I was chatting with the girls in my Facebook group, which is called Toryville, about um, I was sitting, th this computer, you are sitting in my kitchen right now. That's where this camera is. And, um, and I had these guys here doing work, these handyman. And I was sitting, um, in my writing chair and writing and I had my headphones on and they're noise canceling headphones and the first day the guys were here they were joking around with my husband because I cannot hear anything when the noise canceling headphones and music's on it's you know I'm in my own world and the second day that they were here I didn't have music playing or the, or the noise canceling function on I was just sitting there with with the headphones on and they were talking thinking that I couldn't hear them all about their love lives, and it was so interesting. Um, and someone in the group was like, "You should, you should write a book about that." And and that is the type of places that um, that my ideas come from. Uh, just because um, you could, you could build a whole book just around a similar situation, either a girl eavesdropping on a guy's conversation, or the things that I heard them talking about. So, um, so I get them from everywhere if that makes sense. Um, someone asked how long I've been wanting to write a book before I started my first one. And the truth of the matter is, it's a horrible answer, but I never intended to write a book. I never thought about writing a book. Uh, it just didn't even cross my mind. I thought that like authors like sat in some big room somewhere and were selected like a lottery and, and they were allowed to write. And, um, that it was just this impossible business to break into, sort of how I guess I would imagine an editor being or a book reviewer. And um, so I just, it didn't even occur to me, I didn't think that I necessarily had talent. Um, I just was going about my life and, and, not, and not thinking about it. And then, um, but I read all the time. I've, I've been the girl who was like reading at the dinner table um, or in line, you know, while at a store and um and then my mom started writing a book and just talking with her about the process and she was explaining to me about self-publishing um and i was like wow that's pretty cool like that's neat and then she gave me on writing by stephen king i swear i'm not plugging this book but um but i love it and uh and then like i said i got halfway through it and was like okay like I'm going to try this, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to try to write a book. And I wrote Blindfold Innocence in six weeks. And uh, I didn't know any better. I wrote it, I typed the end, I read through it a couple times, I made some minor changes, and then I hit publish. Like nowadays, my process before a book hits the market is so much more intense and involves beta readers and like nine rounds of revisions and um, proofreaders and, you know, goes through a bunch of stages but at that point I didn't know you know I was like looks good to me and I hit publish and then um, and and then it went crazy so um, so I don't know but if any of you read the initial version of blindfold it had a lot of typos um, it, in the in those early stages and it had a crazy cover that um, if you google blindfold innocence you'll see the cover it's actually a picture of me taken like like this area but I'm undressed and, and covering myself and I didn't think it was that crazy but uh, readers see and they're like oh my god so anyways um, uh, Louise asked if that's the C I can hear in the background and absolutely um, and she asked if living by the sea helps me with my writing um, I, you can't see it. I originally tried to set the camera where you could see the ocean, 
Um, I live on the Gulf of Mexico in Florida, and um, and we're right on the water, which if anything is distracting because um, there's constant activity going on, on the beach. But I wouldn't say it helps my writing, but it certainly is a great place. I sit on that porch a lot, and um, the sound of the ocean is a very, um, you know, calming, soothing, non-distracting sound. Um, so, but I just moved to the beach. We lived in a house. I think I moved. We moved like three or four months ago, and um, before that, I lived in a house and I had a writing studio. And I do miss my writing studio. That's the only thing um, that I wish I had because I could go in there and shut the door. And um, and I had a couch and a desk and, and a lot of different places to write on it, places for the dogs to sit because the dogs are always here <laughs> and always want to be um, want to be on my lap. So so that is uh, so. But yes, I live at the beach and uh, and I absolutely love it. I'm very lucky to be in the area that we're in. It's a great area. So, um, and that sort of answers the question someone asked, my favorite place to write. Uh, my favorite place to write, I have a big leather chair, and, um, and that's normally where I get the most done. And the perfect scenario is that no one's in the house, and um, the sliders are open so I can hear the ocean, and then I can just burn out um, a ton of words. But that rarely happens. I, I don't think it's happened in like two weeks. So, um, just someone asked how I come up with names for characters. Uh, I used to, in my studio, I had taped to the wall this um, report. It was, it was a directory of um, medical doctors or attorneys, either attorneys or medical doctors, and it was just names after names and it's like the phone book. The phone book would be great if I could find a phone book. I don't think they make them anymore. Um, the phone book is great and a lot of times I'll post on Facebook and say, hey, I need a reader name or I need a character name. Does anybody want to throw theirs up? And uh, the last time I did that, I think like 300 people responded and I was able to pick a whole slew of characters' names uh, out of that list. So if you follow me on Facebook, keep your eyes out. And if you ever want your name to be used, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, I probably shouldn't have said that because I'm going to get so, <laughs> so many emails. But maybe I'll maybe I'll create a form on my website because I'm always looking for names. It's very difficult to pick a name only because the names that always come to mind are people that I know or last names of people that I know. And that really ruins any type of erotic writing if I, if I have the name of someone I know. And if I try to think of a name of somebody that I don't know, it's very hard. I mean, any name, like Jessica, if I think of, I know five Jessicas or, um, or Jennifer, I know a ton of Jennifers. So that's, that's very, that's one of the, one of the harder things to do, but it's such a simple thing to do, but it's amazing how long I'll struggle over trying to find a name that's attractive and sexy and fun and fits the character. And I have time for one more question. And let me um, let me look through these and try to grab one. Um, someone asked my all-time favorite character. I'm gonna I'm gonna hit a bunch of these questions really quick. My all-time favorite character that I've written would probably be Julia Campbell from the Blindfold Innocent series, just because I can relate to her the most. When I wrote Blindfold Innocence, I was basing her off of me in college. Um, at the time when I met my husband. And so um, she's probably my favorite, also because I've written three books with her, so I've been in her head the longest. Um, will we see a sequel or a continuation for Sex, Love, Repeat is another question. I would love to write a sequel to Sex, Love, Repeat, but I have no idea how I would create a happy ever after for the character that you're wanting a sequel for. So I don't know the answer to that question. I don't want to ruin the first book by trying to make readers happy in a second book. So um, I, do, I don't know the answer to that. Someone's asking about Still. Still was a novella that was part of the Bend anthology that I wrote, um, and I'm expanding that into a full-length book. It will release, I, I'm hoping, sometime in December it should release, barring any type of like 
disaster. Um, and I'm really excited to share that with you guys. I had intended to release it like in September, but uh, Black Lies would not leave my head. Um, and so I had, I had to pay it attention. And, um, and someone asked, will uh, my books be released internationally? Girl in 60, again, just since I'm about to leave, this is the Girl in 60. It's beautiful, it's in bookstores. This is released internationally. It's in Germany. Italy. I just got Italian hardcovers. They gave me like three, uh, and they're really cool. I don't understand a word in them, but they're really neat. Um, but Germany, Italy, like Czech, Australia, Canada, U.S., um, this girl is around, so um, check her out. She's in bookstores now. Um, the Blindfolded and Masked Innocence. Um, these are arcs, so they, the covers a little different, but um, these, I have no idea how many countries they're in, but Harlequin is like everywhere, so um, they're, they're internationally, and then all of my self-published things, uh, all of my self-published books are available in Kindle format in every country you could ever imagine, and paperback format, um, Sometimes you can find them in other countries, but the shipping is like crazy, and I, there's no way for me to, um, to adjust that pricing. Like any international books that I self-publish in paperback, like Australia, I don't make a, a penny off that. I, I've set my um, income to zero, and it still charges like $30 for the book. So I apologize in advance for that, but you can also, I sell signed paperbacks on my website, alessandratore.com. Um, and I ship internationally. So if you ever want any of my books um, and you live in some tiny corner of the world, then um, just go on my website and, uh, and I'll ship you a book. So I had a great time today. Um, thank you so much for dealing with me and, uh, and my um, sore throat. I'm sorry I sound a little masculine today, but um, I had a great time with you all, and uh, if I missed any questions, feel free to email me. My email address is on my website, or hit me up through Facebook or Twitter, and uh, I would love to chat with you. So thank you so much. Thank you for your support of my work and your interest in, in joining me here today. So uh, I hope you have a great day, and um, I'll talk with you guys soon.